It's now time for Talkin' Boxing with Billy C. It began as a podcast, went live on the net, and transformed into a full-blown empire. It's the only daily boxing talk show on the planet, hosted by the only guy with the balls to do it. Many have stepped into the ring. Many have tried to take the belt. And one by one, they've fallen. Another victim of the undisputed heavyweight champion of Boxing Talk Radio. Talking Boxing with Billy C is on now. My style is impetuous, my defense is impregnable, and I'm just ferocious, I want your heart. Live from the Philly C Studios in Lake George, New York. I'm Bill Calagero, and it's time for the Philly C Show. Good morning, good day, good evening, blah, 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 blah. whenever you're listening, whenever you're watching, and I hope you're doing all right today. Today's show is being brought to us in part by Sal's Neighborhood Pizzeria and Italian Restaurant located on St. Simons Island in Georgia. Check out the website, www.salsneighborhoodpizzeria.com. Or give my man a call, 912-268-2328, 912-268-2328. And yeah, I'll say the website again, because it's an easy one to remember. SalzNeighborhoodPizzeria.com, you got to know how to spell. Whip out the old Webster. Oh, that's right, you guys don't even know what Webster Dictionary is. Ask Siri, ask Siri how to spell it. Anyway, today's show is also being brought to us in part by my book, Tom Molino from Bondage, The Baddest Man on the Planet. It's available right now, we're all good books are sold. You can get a copy of it right now while you're watching or listening to the show. Really, right now. Really, just go to Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Looking to get a signed copy? No problem. Just visit the website, BillyCBoxing.com and follow the directions. You need more than one copy? Drop me an email and I'll hook you up with the deal. Oh man, but we give you a deal. Yeah, yeah. Just go to uh, Billy at Talking Boxing, T-A-L-K-I-N, B-O-X-I-N-G dot com. Um, you know, coming up, uh, on the show a little bit later, we're going to be talking about, uh, some updates on Luis Ortiz against Deontay Wilder. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been talking to me, though, that, you know, even when I was away, uh, and, uh, you know, since we've been back, the, the main topic is, do you think, uh, Luis Ortiz is, is really going to fight? Is, is, is he being paid off? Is he laying down for the, for the fraud Deontay Wilder? I mean, I, I don't know, man. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. I got some quotes. Uh, we'll give you an update on uh, Daniel Jacobs' next fight. Uh, I kind of would have liked to have seen him fight uh, Billy Joe Saunders, but uh, we got Suluki instead. We'll talk about that. Plus, talk about frauds. Uh, Jarrell Baby Miller. Uh, we'll talk about uh, him as well. We'll give you an update on Adrian Broner from last week. Uh, Nino Benvenuti, a former... Uh, a uh, world champion and a paisan. I, you know, he he said some interesting things about a fight that's taking place this weekend that uh, we're going to talk about. We got some emails, we got some other news. All of that is coming up uh, in a couple of minutes. But foist, foist, boys and girls, joining me right now uh, is my man Sal Rocky <laughs> Senicola. What's up, Sal? Good morning, Bill. How you doing, buddy? Not too bad. Hey, you know, Sal, I, I want a facelift for you. That's I, I a good look. That's a, I drew, drew your markings here. I'll tell you what, that's a good looking mug you got there. <laughs> that's a good looking mug, huh? <laughs> I tell that's you, the, you know that's the Aunt Billy C you're not mug. Yeah. Uh <laughs> speaking of mugs, I, I got this company. This guy went uh he's doing those brass knuckle mugs. Yeah. Uh, he's disappeared. I you know, I mean these uh yeah. these artists are uh are, are strange. But listen, I know you and I were talking off air a little bit yesterday, but um, I, all right, here's the deal. You know, we, we've been critical of the Utes of today. You know, the Utes of today, right? Yeah. yeah and uh, we're always talking about, uh, you know, uh, participation trophies. You know, the, the kids started. And it's really our generation. We started it all. We started naming things. And, yeah, you know, we, we started you know, doing. We wanted the kids, you know, you know take, to be. I know, but taking care of your kids and trying to give your kids the best, and then what it's evolved to is just, you know, like I always say, you drive uh, uh, down the street, 
And if kids are even going to a bus stop, you see nine minivans parked. I mean, the parents drive them 100 yards from the house to the bus stop. They get to sit in the van until the bus gets there. They run from the van into the bus. You know, I, you know we used to have to walk to the bus stop. Anyway, um, you know, and, and kids, you know, and you talk about sports. Oh, in football, you can't tackle the quarterback anymore. You know, oh, you can't really hit anybody hard. You know, in boxing, oh, no, no, stop it, stop it. He took three, four punches. Stop the fight. It's brutal. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody's so scared, right? Well, I kicked it up a notch. You know, I, every time I do things normal, like a normal routine, Sal, I'm always we thinking. Don't do normal. Yeah, well, yeah, they, they call me, what, what do they call me? Abby. Uh, Abby normal. Abby normal. That's Abby it. Normal. That's it. That's who you were going there. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, you know, everything I look at, I try to apply, you know, and, I, and, and I'm like the Three separate, uh, three degrees of separation to boxing. I'll turn everything back to boxing within three three sentences. But um, I'm at, you know, I was on vacation last week and I, I was at Disney, right? I I, I took uh, uh, my grandkids and kids and yeah. and then some uh, down to Disney. We had a great time. But one of my observations was that I know I know I already told you this, so you left. One of my observations is this. Now now remember, boys and girls, you're in Florida, right? So it's kind of warm, and, and we were lucky. We had some nice warm weather, man. It was in the in the upper 80s, and it was kind of hot and humid, and Close and to it the was it, it was actually what I wanted, you know, being uh, from upstate New York. But but nonetheless, in case you've never been to Disney, and if you haven't, I, I strongly recommend it because everyone should you know get fleeced a, a million dollars for a cup of coffee and. Uh, wait on line seven miles long to go on a five minute legs. ride. Um, but but aside from all of that, and to see Mickey, if I see Mickey, and these freaky <laughs> other things that make you have nightmares. But anyway, anyway, aside from all of that, um, I, I'm I'm sitting here and I'm I'm I'm, I'm I have an observation, right? And yes. I'm watching all these parents with these kids, and I'm talking about kids, let's say from seven years old and younger. All right. Yes, and they're in yeah. these double and triple and quadruple strollers, right? So the parents, the parents, now remember, it's 86 degrees, hot and humid, and the parents are pushing these kids around, right? Now, granted, a two or three year old, you got it, but a five, six, seven yeah. year old, I mean, you're going there for them. And the parents are pushing them around in these, uh, you know, strollers that are shielding them from the sun. The kids got sunglasses on. They got little fans uh, on the on Richard the rim of the of the strollers, cooling them off. And mom and dad are sweating their you know what's off, pushing them from here to there, delivering them to the rides, waiting online, feeding them ice cream, <laughs> giving them what. And I'm saying to myself, no wonder why everybody. I mean, we're starting these kids. We didn't even make them wait on a line for God's sakes. What, what's your thoughts? Well, you know my thoughts. Forget about it. Um, Billy, that's the generation we are uh, evolving to. And that is the generation that is going to be our caretakers and our leaders one day. And you know what? I, I hope when the rubber meets the road that these kids uh, uh, grow to be strong, grow to be this and that. But, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to look at. You know, just a few generations. And what I've done even with my kids, I've tried to coddle them. I've tried to protect them. I've tried to make things easy for them. And, you know, they're, they're great young men. And uh, But, you know, still, they, they, uh, they didn't have it in the generation or in the environment that you and I grew up in. And, you know, they, they, they were dropped off at their bus stops. They were this. Now, my kids walk to the bus stop today, and it's a, a good quarter, maybe a half mile. But, you know, it, it, it's still different. It's still different today. And there, there's, you know, we want to protect our kids. And that's part of it. A society today, you know, you have, unfortunately, predators and nasty bad people that can make havoc. And, and one, one uh, uh, blind side or one split second, lives could be changed forever. So, yes, we, we compensate. We overprotect. We do things. And... And I think it has yielded a softer uh, generation of what's to come later. A half a mile. I'm I'm reporting you to 
to the child my protection agency. Uh, maybe, I, maybe, I mean, come on, man. Just under half a mile. And my kids do it every day. Although now Sal's driving. <laughs> yeah, you're driving <laughs> behind them. Okay, yeah, walk. Right. <laughs> you know, I, listen. <laughs> you, th- you think he wants to give his brother a lift to school? Forget about it. You got to walk. You, you know, the funny thing is, is, don't get me wrong. Don't start writing the emails to me, boys no, and no, girls. No, no, the no, the no, truth of the matter you, is, you, you is the- everybody, just like you just said, we all want to give our kids better than what we got, right? Yeah. I mean, that's normal. But what's happened today is it's 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 like went past go and collected two hundred dollars for doing nothing. And and what we're getting is we're getting a, a generation of of kids that feel entitled and that they don't have to start at the bottom. I, I'll never forget. And this was a while ago. I'll never forget. Somebody came in and and was asking for a job, and he and he brings me a resume. And he's 18 years old. And he's telling me he's got 10 years experience in the computer field. And I'm going, <laughs> you're 18, you know? <laughs> so where, 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 oh I said, I'm goodness. curious. I'm curious. Wh- wh- where's your experience, you know? And he starts telling me, well, I've, you know, worked on my uh, dad's computer and I did this and did that. And okay, you know, I mean, it's some experience. But then it comes time to, to talking about the pay. And the 18 year old kid was looking for 50 grand a year, for God's sakes, you know? And it's like, where do they come off? You got to start at the bottom. It makes it, it helps, it helps mold you. It's, it's the foundation, you know? I, I don't know. And, and anyway, was, getting, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I can go on and on. And, and the truth of the oh, matter is, getting back to boxing, we wonder why we get these kids. And I say kids, you know, in their 20s and they've turned pro and they're ready to fight. And, you know, like we were talking briefly before the air, uh, before we came on, you know, some some of these young fighters, they already know because, you know, the world is, is filled with information. So they already know, hey, it's important for me to, to be undefeated. Uh, so I don't want to fight this guy. It's too tough. You know, I, I remember when I was working with a sanctioning body and we were, we were uh, trying to get fights for titles or whatever. And you got a fighter that wants to, you know, either fight for or defend a belt. And it's and you start looking for opponents. And you, you bring a, you bring the guy an opponent and say, hey, OK, uh, Mr. A, uh, here is your opponent. Oh, no. Oh, no. We don't want him. He's he's too tough, you know. He's too tough. You're, you're fighting for a title, hundred fighter. I can't approve it, you know. I, I mean, it's just you know the whole mindset, Sal, is you know. And and I have a quote that you're gonna love from uh, uh, Nino Benvenuti. But the whole the idea and the hope that when they step in a ring with a real opponent that that is dangerous, that's a world beater, that's this and that, they're just gonna do their best to survive and and win. Maybe they're gonna rise to the occasion. Maybe they won't. And the reality of what they're uh, doing and preparing for and finally all their years at, or days in this case uh, prepared for is going to be revealed inside a few short rounds. And, and that's the reality of where we are today. And it's no longer uh, just looking at an undefeated record, but you've got to look at the substance that, 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 that made this fighter evolve to where he is today to earn a title shot. And, and that's the most important thing, the pathway and what they've endured and uh, because you know you could have a, you could have a guy that comes right out of a, a golden box that uh, that that's had all the right fights that had this and that and then he steps in a ring and boom he he doesn't know the first thing about the uh, slipping a punch or blocking a punch or countering a punch and he's going to eat a uh, eat a right hand and, and he's going to be knocked out you know it, it's it's hard to say and you have the promoters you have some some uh, managers that just bank on one superstar, they think they can make them a, a, a household name and they, they want to protect them until the end. And in the end, it's usually the end for everybody. Yeah, it's, it's sad. Hey, for all the uh, um, affiliates, uh, both radio and TV, we are not taking a break here, so uh, move to the next one. Um, you know, I, it brings me to this, Sal. You know, it's like what I've said in the past. You know, you look at the story of a, of a fighter, and it's always the same. Came from nothing, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, you know, used boxing to get himself out of it or get herself out of it. Um, you know, but when you take a look at life, and if you go back to the early 1900s when, you know, guys like uh, Jack Dempsey were kids and, and you know, so on and so forth, even, even prior to that uh, when uh, Jack Johnson was on his way up, the, the poverty, when, when you said poverty, I mean, Jack Dempsey, uh, he quit school in like 
fifth grade because he was embarrassed because they had no money. I mean, not only did he go to school with no shoes, the only clothes he could wear was his sister's. You know, and talk about being bullied. You know, today a kid gets picked on on the Internet, not even to their face, and they go home and commit suicide. Or, or they, you know, grab a, a couple of automatic rifles and go and wipe out of school. You know, I mean, it's sad. Um, these guys, uh, the poverty level 100 years ago was 10 times worse than it is today. Now, granted, poverty is poverty. I'm not suggesting poverty is easy today, but it's certainly an easier life than it was 100 years ago. And with that said, you know, everything is easy. And, and as, as adults, if you bring up a kid who's been handed everything and has never been held accountable for mistakes or anything else where you pat on the back and says, hey, you're still number one to me. You finished last in the race, but you're still number one to me. You know, and, and you don't give them any, any drive to improve. You see, that's the key. You want support, Sal. We all want to support our kids, and we want to support them, especially when they fail, because you, the idea behind it is to, is to correct what you did wrong and get better. That's the idea of supporting a failure. But what happens today is they support a failure and don't improve. They accept the failure as acceptance. Oh, it's okay. Let's move on to the next one. See if you get that one right. And it's the same principle with boxing. You know, they, they're handed a, an easy opponent. Hey, you kicked the snot out of this guy, so let's give you another one just like him. And they're pounding their chest saying they're the best. What's your thoughts? You, you hit it right on the head across the board, Bill. That's the reality of our generation, of where we are today in boxing and sports and, and right now in, in our families and upbringing. I, I'm not saying on the whole, but, but certainly as an example, there are classic cases of that across the board. And you are 100% correct, Amundo, as one person used to say that. Remember who that person was? Uh, yeah, uh, I think I do. Who? Who was it? That was Fonzie. Oh, right, right, right. I knew Fonzie. I, I, knew I heard it. Correct the Mundo, I knew, didn't I, I knew I heard it. I knew I heard it. But I just, <laughs> Henry you know, Winkler. It's, it, it's hard to see him do commercials today. Oh, especially about reverse mortgages <laughs> trying to rip you off. I mean, don't ever. Anybody listening, if you <laughs> wait, know, don't wait, ever wait, do a Tom, reverse Tom mortgage. Selleck, too. Tom you know, Selleck, oh, who was a young, brashing guy. I love and, what he and, said. Uh, oh, yeah, you need money. Do a reverse mortgage. It, yeah, and then when you're 85 and you really need a roof the, over your head, well, sorry, get the hell out. Go like this, and when you're older and we could do – yeah, it, it's like he, he puts on another act because he doesn't sound like that every day. But Tom, Tom Selleck's telling you, well, yeah, when I was there and we found it was a good time to do a reverse mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, he's appealing to a generation. Yeah, well, the thing is that what they're trying to do is appeal to people in need. Obviously, they got the well, right to do it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, back to uh, <clears throat> boxing. Yeah, this was... is a boxing show. Um, you know, Sal, you and I have talked about it, and, and I, I know you've been asked uh, You know, quite often. Uh, you know, I've, I've been asked so much, I'm sick of it, and that's why we're talking about it today. But Luis Ortiz um, you know, tested uh, positive apparently one time. The second time it was in his... Uh, <clears throat> blood pressure meds, whatever the case was, not one but two previous fights against Deontay Wilder had been canceled due to uh, positive uh, PED testing. Well, three, uh, the third time, uh, it's uh, still going on as far as I know. And Get a lot of people it. are giving me the indication that they feel that Luis Ortiz is basically getting a payday and it, the result is already uh, foregone. It's already uh, made that um, Luis Ortiz is going in for a retirement uh, payday so he can ride off into the sunset, make enough money to, to live the rest of his life, and he's not going to put up much of a fight against Deontay and that the plan is, is for Deontay to knock him out in three rounds or less. What's your thoughts on this assumption? Uh, I think, it, it, hey, guess what? I would assume the same thing without me even looking too deep into the um, uh, what's been happening behind the scenes. I mean, Luis Ortiz, you know, I, we saw him his last fight out. He certainly did not look like a world beater. In fact, he looked like a, a, a good stationary target that Deontay Wilder is going to go off on and hit him from all angles. And that's and that was I like to call now a drunken, drunken octopus style of fighting. One punch is going to wind up the other, and he's just going to flail and wail away. And I, I, I don't think this fight's going to go six rounds. Yeah, 
I, and, I mean, and, and I, yes, is, is Ortiz looking to ride out in the sunset? Well, I, you know, why not? If this is what he wants to do, if this is where he is, and this is a big fight, he's going to finally rise to the occasion and pass all the PED tests and all that stuff, maybe he's going to uh, to cash in. And, you know, uh, a loss to Deontay Wilder is going to be uh, a good payday for him. And you know what? He'll still have... Some credibility left and some ranking where he'll he'll get another couple of big fights if he wants or a couple of uh, decent fights and uh, and then he'll retire and ride off in the sunset. Well, I mean the the thing is is that you know I had the luxury of calling uh, several of Luis Ortiz's early professional fights when he first came over uh, here in the states and and at that time. You know, I, I saw a big guy, but I wasn't overly impressed. Now, I was also ringside for what I thought was his best performance when he uh, destroyed uh, 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 Bryant Jennings. And at that point, I said, you know, this guy is the real deal. I also realized that he was a type of a fighter that fought up to his level of opposition. He's a guy that when he fought a slug, fought like a slug. When he had a fight, a, a real fighter, he fought like a real fighter. He does possess hand speed. Uh, he does possess accuracy. But I, I think, and he's a big guy, I, I think he's way older than we think. I'm thinking that Luis Ortiz, and on paper I think they say he's 40 now, I'll bet you that he's every bit of 45, even maybe. 48 that that's how old i think this guy really is and you know when you get to be that age your your body just does not respond as quickly as your mind is telling it to and with that said i think he realizes that he needs to make some money and i would not sal be surprised as if this fight and they had plenty of times to discuss it especially after the last time when, you know, Luis Ortiz, apparently uh, the WBC would not sanction the fight between him and Deontay because they found a substance that later was proved to be part of his blood pressure medicine uh, that he wouldn't let him fight. And then Team Ortiz thanks the WBC for looking out for the health of their fighter. <laughs> Anybody else would have said, are you effing kidding me? You know, this yeah. is part of his meds, da 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 and they would have fought it. This team, Team Ortiz, welcomes it and thanks the WBC. And then guess what? The miracle happens. The fight is signed for the next time. You know, so I think they just had a lot of time to talk behind closed doors, Sal. Yes, I, I, I think they did. Uh, I cannot say uh, what was actually said that suggests that maybe this is his, his big hurrah. And this is the way the bouncing ball is going to tumble. Uh, but you know what? You can't discount it. You know, because it, it, it happens. And, you know, Luis Ortiz, yes, maybe he is in his, well into his 40s by now. And how many fights or how many years does he have left? So is he looking for uh, something for the future now? And you know what? When you get older, too, you realize, like I said, when you're younger and you're a young buck, you, you know, the prize is worth the price. You know, the, the prize is up here. And the price you got to pay to get there. It's like, hey, you could hit me with a locomotive. I'm keep coming. You know, it doesn't matter to me. But when you get older and you realize things and you see things, you know, and, the, and the, you see your peers, other fighters are walking around on their heels or not doing well or, or are going to be using diapers early on. I mean, it's 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 uh it's a shame, and so the reality is, is the prize still worth the price? Now, for some, yes, but for others, they're saying, hey, you know what? Maybe, maybe I should plan my my exit strategy and, and get a payday and, and uh, see what I could do. That's, that's so. It's reality. You get older, you you think differently on some level. Yeah, but you know what the biggest difference is? Talk to me, Goose. The big the the biggest difference. <laughs> Is that the sport of boxing, and really any sport, any athlete, but but more so in the sport of boxing because it's yes. you know one against one. There's an important word that's that seems to be disappearing from the uh, from 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 the the dictionary of of professional fighting, and that word, Sal, is pride. You know, pride, years pride. ago, yes, years pride. ago, a fighter 
they were proud to go out on their shield. That was an indication that they were trying the best to the bitter end. You know, to suggest that a fighter today realizes that his days are numbered and wants to go out uh, making another guy look fantastic, uh, even, uh, you know, finding a soft place to lay down, uh, that shows me that this guy, and I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen with Lisa Ortiz, but any person that would choose that has zero pride, you know, and all they care about is the money. For a guy that has pride, what's your thoughts on that? No, a guy that has pride is going to no, go You're the guy with the pride. Out. You're the guy right? with the pride. That's right. I'm the guy with the pride. Right. Let me tell you, I got, I got to show you a picture of my pride and joy one day. Wait till you see it. I got to get it out of my old wallet. But anyway, listen. My cousin uh, Philip gave it to me one day, uh, a copy of it. But anyway, you're right, Billy. You know what? No way in hell can can one that has the pride, has the fervor, has the 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 gumption to say, "Hey, this is me. This is my career. This is my life." You know, you know, not to just talk about me, but other fighters. They approach a fight, especially when they're in their later years. You know, you got to approach a fight or a fight of life. You got to approach it with the enthusiasm, as as I like like to put it, with the enthusiasm, the fervor, and the anticipation of it being like your pro debut. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to also realize that it's, you got to do it with the with the uh, big bang theory. This might be your last hurrah. So go out winning and go out and put it all on the line because this is the one you're going to talk about forever. That's what you got to look at. That's pride. That's what you do. And that's what fighters are supposed to do. They're supposed to fight. That's the term fight. You fight for victory. You fight in life. You fight forever. And that's the whole thing. You don't lay down. You don't look for a soft cushion in a ring and you don't just just take it and and and, and bow down and, and leave gently no you got to fight to win and that was an old saying by aaron Pryor. and how common sense was that you got to fight to win and if you don't want to win that fight you have no reason of being in that boxing ring and disney you fight for a glass of water i'll tell you that you but sure uh do. <laughs> or, hey did you walk around one of those big boom boom bang bang turkey legs it's like you could bang a drum. You ever see those turkey legs? Yeah. They're massive. Yeah, no, I, I saw them. I, 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 they were at one of the, uh, in Epcot, they were in one of the, uh, at one yeah. of the food booths. But, uh, no, I was very disappointed in the food. Uh, you know, from no, my previous come time. On. We I, have to become the South. How, how, what do you do? What do you got? You, you, you want to know what, Sal? Now. The truth <laughs> of the matter is, is one of the things I looked forward to was the Italian restaurant that they have in Epcot in Italy. Yeah. And I have had been there before, and it changed names. It's something else. I was so disappointed. Uh, none of the food is made to order. It was, it was terrible. It really was. And um, I, I, I'm, I was very disappointed. You know, I, although it seemed not the prices in that restaurant, but it seemed like the prices of the food, like at the food courts and stuff, were were not as outrageous as they used to be. It was, you know, you'd spend five bucks more for a sandwich instead of 20 bucks more, you know, uh, which wasn't outrageous to me. But on those upper upper class restaurants, like the one I, you know, wanted to go to, I was very disappointed. And, uh, you know, that it really, it really wasn't what Disney used to be. I mean, uh, it, it was a shame. Uh, compared to Sal's, what are you, nuts? I wouldn't even, I wouldn't oh. even insult you. You know, the only difference yeah. is you got people from Georgia working at your place and this place got people from Italy working there and they were sick. They were I, I, I got to talk to some of the uh, uh, the servers there from Italy and they were they were they definitely told me the truth and everything after I tricked the one. But, uh, um, you, uh, you know, they said it's it's a shame. They were telling me stuff, which I'll talk to you about off air, about the differences of of the food and, and cooking between like Italy and, and generally Europe and the United States, you know, uh, and how everything they have those growth hormones and everything we eat here in the U.S. Even even something as simple as pasta, Barella pasta, which is the number one selling pasta in Italy, is not even the same version that we get here in the States. No, it was it, it was sickening, sickening to hear. But uh, Bill. anyway, anyway, you know what? Wow. I'll tell you what. Today, I decided just now that we're going commercial free today. So for all of the affiliates, uh, both radio and TV, no commercials on my end. Cut your own damn commercials in. All right, Sal, <laughs> let's listen to some uh, notes. You know, they're really trying to promote um, Luis Ortiz, Deontay Wilder. They're trying to really build it up. 
Uh, and, and I think that one of the main reasons they're doing this is because of the fact that Deontay Wilder is not a draw. This is a guy that does not really draw. He's, he's saying he's the best heavyweight of all time. Uh, he's, he's riled up guys like Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis. Uh, says he's scared. He's honestly scared for his opponents that he might kill them and all of these things, right? And, and actually says, oh, look at my resume. It speaks for itself. I'm doing things nobody has done in this sport ever in the heavyweight division. You know, and I'm like saying to myself, what? You know, what, what do they got this guy? They, they, they got him living in the cone of silence and, and, and you know, piping him in with, with, with propaganda. But, but then all of a sudden, I'm hearing things from Luis Ortiz. This is a guy who doesn't even speak English, and he's starting to get talkative. And some of the quotes that he said, I'm going to read to you. And, and after each one, uh, we'll get your thoughts. This first one is on Deontay Wilder himself. You know, he was asked about Deontay Wilder. And uh, Luis Ortiz says he's talking too much. He's going to have to back up what he's saying in the ring. He says he's going to kill King Kong. He says he's going to knock me out. I want to watch him try. I'm not like those other guys he fought. I'm a real fighter. I'm tough, and I got a lot of experience. I've been fighting since I was 10 years old. He doesn't intimidate me. His trash talk makes me laugh. It's just a lot of noise. I'm hungry. I'm doing this for my family. He better take me seriously because he's going to find... Uh, himself on the canvas before he knows it. I'm going to show the world who King Kong really is. Um, was that from Luis Ortiz or was that from his publicist? I think that was from his publicist. Well written. <laughs> I don't know. You know, uh, I'll tell you what, though. Uh, it, it, it would be good to see if he, he can uh, fuel those words with his actions and see what happens. I mean, we, we may have a good fight, but... Uh, yeah, as you said earlier, it's going to be hard to really see that kind of Luis Ortiz stepping in the ring against Deontay Wilder. You know, I hope that uh, I hope that he means this. Um, yeah, me too. Because I because hope, uh, he he does have the talent. If he, tra- he if power. he's been training and he's in good shape, he does have the cha- talent to give Wilder some trouble. Um, the question is going to be, can he can he can he handle a, a shot from Deontay? But you know, you talk about this octopus drunken octopus style of Deontay being being to his advantage I find it the opposite I find it to a, as a disadvantage to a guy who can box now granted a, a guy that's that's fighting like a drunken octopus can always land a lucky punch and that's what he banks on but more often than not a sharpshooter uh you know a boxer that can that's uh, you know accurate and can, and can land punches and and know when to uh, you know, move to avoid a punch and, and counter punch. Um, a, a guy that with such an awkward style is is almost like a sitting duck in there. And uh, if Luis Ortiz really, if he if the same Ortiz comes and fights Deontay Wilder that I witnessed fight Bryant Jennings, Wilder is going to be not coming out the victor. I'll tell you that. Well, and that's that's the beauty about boxing. You never know what's going to happen and what's going to be in, in each other's heart and the minds that night of the fight. And, uh, you know, it, it, that's why I always say any given night, you can one fighter could be another. And uh, it's it's that kind of game. And, you know, we don't know the psyche, the mentality, the mindset. And, and you know, oh, wait, when, you, when you're fighting a style like Deontay, yeah, if you're a classic boxer and you're strong, you keep your hands up to block those flailing punches coming at you and the momentum and then you strike inside when he's got his arms open you stick it if you counter you do what you got to do yeah you're gonna give him problems and and uh you're gonna probably be connecting and knocking him out but the problem is that there's it's just it's just not the level of talent out there today that knows this or sees that and and takes that time to school it and to prepare for a style like his the way that they should be and, you know, if, if or Luis Ortiz or Anthony Joshua, you know, takes that time. To, and I think Joshua will. And I think Joshua does prepare for each fighter that he's going to face. And I think, you know, you look at his style and, yeah, you're going to keep the hands up. You're going to move. You're going to not be stationary target. You're going to counter. You're going to block. And, you know, it could be a, a good night of boxing display against somebody who can fight Deontay Wilder with their fight in mind, not his fight. You know, we all talked about that um, WWE move after Luis Ortiz uh, was in with a sacrificial lamb in his last fight, and Deontay Wilder pops up into the ring. 
uh, Ortiz was asked about that, and he said, somebody told me Wilder was in the crowd. I smiled. Someone told him? They knew. They, I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know. uh, he says, uh, I was glad to see him. I knew what he wanted. I'm not the kind of guy that likes to talk trash, but I've had it with this guy. He talks too much. He's got a big mouth. He's insulted me and has said too many dumb things. So when I saw him ringside, I told him to get inside the ring and to tell the world once and for all that he was going to fight me. He says he wants to fight the top fighters. I'm a top fighter. Let's do it. Um, you know, I, I, whether this is, a like you said, maybe coming from a publicist or really coming from uh, Luis Ortiz, if it's true, this is what I want to hear. This is the Luis Ortiz I want to see. want to hear. But uh, I have a feeling the Luis Ortiz we're going to see is the guy that's going to look for a soft place to, to take a little 10-second <laughs> snooze. Uh, but uh, but we'll see. What's your, what's your thoughts on his version of the WWE move uh, when Wilder popped up into the ring? I, I think it was it was staged. I think he could have been a little bit more brash about it, but uh, you know it's a it's a, it is what it is. And if that's what they have to do to sell tickets, I mean, you hit it on the head. Deontay Wilder is not the biggest drawer to 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 the to the fight game. I mean, it's a uh, he, he's got a local base. He's got well, he, no, he's got a decent fan base. But I mean, he's just you. Know, He's not. He, he, how how did the uh, what, what, what's the word that Al Gore used a couple couple elections ago? He doesn't seem to have the gravitas that that, that, that really pulls attention and pulls uh, fight fans in to watch the fight. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know. He 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 tries his antics. He tries to be loud. He tries to be vocal. He tries, but you know, fans are fickle on a lot of levels. Boxing fans because they. They don't want just the fluff. They want to see the stuff. And I use that term, but I'm telling you what. I think Deontay Wilder, if he could deliver more of the stuff and, and have less of the fluff, uh, he'll, he'll have a better fan base. So we'll see what happens. Al Gore, is, is he still alive? Well, uh, didn't he say, didn't he say, didn't he come out? He when, said he invented he that. He said, Did he come he, out with that uh, that term gravitas? Listen, a, a, he, ever since he said he invented the internet, have you, I haven't taken anything serious about the guy. But uh, anything. <laughs> But no, no. But remember that you never heard the word gravitas used. Boom! Someone comes out with gravitas. Every newscaster on the whole TV set, every channel. That was the new buzzword of the decade. Gravitas. He doesn't have gravitas. He has gravitas. There's not enough gravitas. I get sick of this stuff. It's like somebody comes out with a catchphrase, catch saying, and bam! Everybody's got to jump on a bandwagon. Next time I come what into society, Sal's, we are. Next time I come into Sal's and I get. Uh, a, 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 a delicious dish. I'm going to say when they come by and say, "Can I get you anything else?" I'm going to say, "Could you get me a side of gravitas, please?" I, I would like to add some gravitas on my on my you know chicken. Yeah, you know. but uh, you know anyway, how many of my, my my staff will come up to me. Yes, Sal, Billy, Billy, yeah, I want some gravitas. Billy C wants. Do we have any? <laughs> do we have any gravitas around? <laughs> um, it's a double charge espresso. He, wants, he it. said he wants the spicy gravitas. Uh, anyway. Uh, when they asked him about <laughs> when they asked him about uh, <laughs> testing positive um, against Wilder uh, for the first fight, he says a lot of people uh, that believe in me and know me know that I wouldn't do anything that can jeopardize my future as a fighter. I have too much at stake, my family, my kids, and the possibility to provide for them. I had been taking that medicine for two years. It was my mistake not to do disclosed that prescription drug in the paperwork. I never thought a prescription drug was going to bring me so much trouble. I was taking the medicine to treat high blood pressure, but apparently it's also used to go to the bathroom and, and uh, go to the bathroom a lot and mask other drugs. I drink two gallons of water a day. I go to the bathroom a lot already. I never put the two and two together. I'm clean. The dose they found in my system was too low to mask anything at all. If I would have known that this prescription drug wasn't allowed, I would have told my trainer and my doctor. I'm a heavyweight. I don't need to make weight. Why am I going to go to the trouble of taking an illegal substance that makes you go to the bathroom a lot? I have no need. I simply didn't know it was banned. If I would have known, I would have said something to my trainer or to the doctors. I think the fight wasn't meant to be at that point in, the, in that time last year. Destiny plays a part in it. It was supposed to be postponed. Now there's no excuses. Uh, before you respond to that, um, it was really... The second fight about the blood pressure, the first fight, I thought was a weight masking thing. So if he's suggesting that it's been the same drug, see, I don't know enough. I try to, I purposely stay away from the PED uh, stuff because it's you. 
it's a full-time job to keep up with with the ever-changing PED world. So, um, but uh, but uh, you know, um, what's your thoughts on on his explanation for that, Sal? Well, it sounds like uh, again a lot of rhetoric, a lot of the fluff without the stuff, and a lot of a lot of he said, she said kind of kind of thing that that I think he's just been pumped with the the right things to say. Uh, you know what you're doing, and and if there's something found like that, I, first of all, you know I I I don't know. I'm not a doctor, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. But if he's on blood pressure medicine, yes, yeah, some of them have diuretics in them that that will help uh uh uh, uh you urinate and and lower lower the volume of of, of fluid in your body. Um, and and sometimes uh, at, at his age or stage, if he if his kidney, kidneys don't work as as well, who knows? Who knows? But the bottom line is, if you're on blood pressure medicine and it's got some illegal substance, it should have been disclosed or should have been found, should have been discovered as it was, and then you know change the prescription, do what you got to do, and 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 see what what uh, what the med board is gonna is gonna say about it. But um, you know, for all intents and purposes, he's doing what he's got to do. He, he he's saying the right stuff and he's doing the right things. So you know, I can't I can't down him. Whether it's staged, whether it's whether it's just evolved, you know, that's the, that's the two different stories that we don't know. Um, when he was asked on how important the f- this particular fight is for him, he says, "Every fight I've had in my career has been important. The key is always to avoid thinking that it's win or die because that will put you off center." So the way I see it is that this fight is important for me because I have to win it, and I'm gonna. It's a world championship for me, but it's uh, but in addition, it's just another day at work. My only goal is to win the fight, win, win, win. By winning this fight, everything else unfolds. I get a title, and I help my family. Um, he's gonna be able to help his family with the moolah he's gonna make with or without the title. But clearly, Sal, if he does win this fight, and he does win that title. Now, all of a sudden, he's the guy in the mix. Not only, I don't know if they have a rematch clause with Wilder, but not only would he be in a position to make a ton of money uh, fighting a rematch with Wilder, but he becomes the guy uh, to fight the winner of uh, A.J. Joseph Parker. What's your thoughts on that line? <laughs> I mean, that, that is the line. Let me tell you something. This guy is, is going to step into the ring for the moment every fighter trains for, for the moment that every fighter dreams of, a title shot. And for him to not take it seriously and to rise to the occasion, do everything and anything he can to help himself mentally and physically to prepare to be a, a victorious would be foolish and short-sighted. Of course this guy has a shot. Of course he can. Uh, if he takes it serious. If he's looking, as you suggest, maybe for a place to lay down and payday, uh, you know, it's going to be revealed within two or three rounds. Easy. But if this guy comes out and he says, man, I got the, I, I could be in a driver's seat in 45 minutes when I leave this ring or, or sooner. And guess what? I'm going to do the best I can to knock out and shock the world, and I'll be in a driver's seat. I'll be making a big money. I'll be going for the title against Joshua. I'll be doing it. Do you realize how your life can change inside of 40 minutes just in a ring or 45 minutes just in a ring on your performance? So with that incentive in mind, and he wants to save his family's world and everything else and get the big money, get the title, get that. Yeah, that's pride. That's enough incentive for any fighter to give it his best. And that's all you are asking for for the title shot. Each fighter giving it his best and fighting to win. So if that's his mindset and that's where he's locking on, my hat's off to him. I want to see him perform. I want to see him do a great job that night. Well, when they asked him what's exactly going to happen on fight night, he said, when I get in that ring, all I'll be thinking about is the strategy we have put together in the gym. My family's always there. They go to every fight. That was my promise to them when I had to leave them behind in Cuba uh, to come to the United States. They will come with me wherever I go. If I gas out, I look at them, and they keep me going. They are my motivation, and they will ha- help me achieve this victory. Um, you know, it clearly looks like he's... Uh, uh, saying all the right things if he's actually saying sure is. it. Um, you know, uh, and and a family member watching you uh, in the audience can work in either direction. It can help motivate you or it could also help uh, you, uh, you know, decide that you've taken enough for their benefit, you know, especially if a wife is watching you getting your 
tail handed to you and you see uh you see them you know uh, having a real hard time you may uh uh try to put them out of their misery by you stopping the fight you know so i i don't know i don't know i've always thought that having no family members at the ring is the smartest move you you think about your family and you think about what you're doing it for but to have them there um i think it's a distraction what, what's your thoughts you know bill i'll tell you what i used to have all my family i used to have all my fans and, and let me tell you something I, I don't believe that i believe you know what you're fighting you're for yourself yes but you are never going to let your family or your fans down. And what I mean by that is, like I said, you're going you're gonna to be eating leather. You're going to get cut. You're going to do whatever you got. You got pride. I mean, so that family should be a motivation. Uh, family should be, uh, and fans should be a motivation for you not to give up, not to give in, and to do what you got to do. And your bottom line is, when you're really focused in a fight, you're not thinking about it. You know they're there, and you're fighting for yourself. You're fighting for them. You're using the, their their presence as 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 hey, I'm not going to disappoint you. I'm gonna I'm gonna win this fight. I'm gonna make it happen. I'm not giving up. And you're either gonna win, or you're gonna get carried out on a stretcher. That's I, I that that was my experience. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, you know, as a motivation. Well, well, I mean, hopefully, you know, that's still the the thought. You know, I mean, yeah. hopefully, that's still the thought process. But uh, no, I, I, anyway. hopefully, that is still the thought. But no, family's going to be there. I'll tell you, my mother never came to a fight. She never wanted to. She never went to any 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 of my fights, amateur or professional. But my father, forget about it. And my uncles, my aunts, and 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 fans, and family members, and friends, yeah. And, uh, and, 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 uh, it was there. And you know what, when I stepped in the ring, uh, from my amateur career onto my professional career, it was good to know they were there and no way was I going to embarrass myself or no way was I going to lose or do something. I was willing to fight and die in that ring that night. That's, that's the bottom line. That's the mindset of a, of a young warrior. Okay. Before the realities of what you're doing really set in when you're older. So yes, that, that you're putting it on the line. That's the mindset of a real fighter. Well, here's, here's uh, you know, to, to extend on that, you look at Luis Ortiz. He's an older fighter. He knows that his days are numbered. He knows yes. that he's not financially secure. So yes. he also knows that he could become financially secure by doing what they tell him to do in this fight. And if they've told him, be easy on Deontay, we'll throw you an extra million uh, behind closed doors, and he realizes that that's going to set him up, <laughs> he might bring the family and go, listen, you come and enjoy yourself because I'm having somebody else pay for your trip. <laughs> But uh, don't worry, I'm not going to take a beating because I'm going to find a nice soft place to lay down for 10 seconds and then we'll go out and party afterwards. You know, I just hope that's not the set. I just hope that that pride, that word we talked about earlier, pride still exists with Luis Ortiz. Um, and if it does, then he will fight to his best ability. Whether it's good enough to beat Deontay Wilder or not, we won't know until uh, the fight night. But uh, as long as he still has pride... And he hasn't replaced pride with necessity or with, you know, um, uh, the word I'm looking for uh, similar to when you age and you start looking, looking at things differently. Um, let's hope that pride hasn't been substituted with that, you know, where he's thinking long term. He's thinking life uh, after boxing. This could be very well his last fight, et cetera, et cetera. As long as that's not in his mind. Uh, Deontay's in for a tough fight. If he's already knowing that the fight... You know what? We'll know at the weigh-in, Sal. Because if, if if Luis Ortiz comes in, and he's not known for being a chiseled guy anyway, but if he comes no. into this fight overweight, then we know damn well that this is a set-up fight. If he comes in and he's in good shape and it looks like he had a nice hard training camp, then we know that we're going to at least get the best that Luis Ortiz can give us at this stage of his career. What's your thoughts? It could be, and and we'll look at that. But you know what? You just reminded me of. I just had a flashback, and uh, and it wasn't pretty. I remember the night when they made the in introductions. The night I cried when Muhammad Ali went in the ring against Larry Holmes. Muhammad Ali, who you know in, l in his later years had trouble with his weight, and uh, he would come in a little heavier than he should have. Well, that night he entered the ring with Holmes. He looked. He looked. Ten years younger. He looked lean. He looked thin. He looked good. But it was also later 
said that he was on uh, uh, diuretics uh, to help him lose weight, to help him this and that. But that also hurt his minerals and electrolytes and all the other things that he did uh, have. And I, I think it helped him become dehydrated later in a fight where he was just a punching bag in those later rounds anyway until the referee stopped it. So, you know, we'll see. If the, if it's a chiseled look or if it's a, he'll never be chiseled, Luis Ortiz. But if it's a, a lean look, hopefully it's not going to be from the PEDs or the, or, the, or the diuretics or anything else. He may be taken for blood pressure. And if it's due to conditioning, running, diet, exercise, and being in great shape, then, yeah, then that's going to be the, the fighter we're going to want to see. You know, the funny thing is, is throughout this uh, whole, since the announcement of this fight, aside from trash talk from both sides, I haven't heard anything about their training camps. I haven't heard who they're sparring. I haven't heard nothing. You know, so, uh, you know, and a lot of times when, when you're not hearing anything about a training camp, you know, I mean, sometimes you can't believe anything. Sometimes you got to believe everything. I, I don't. Sometimes you got to pick out pieces to believe and what not to believe. But the truth of the matter is, is all we're hearing is trash talk. We're not seeing nothing. We're not hearing about you know uh, when you hear a tra- oh, training camp's going good. He's knocking out all this sparring, but we're not hearing that. You know, training camp's going good. He brought in you know Crusher, Killer yeah, Kowalski yeah, yeah. as a as a tra- sparring. No, he brought in little pa- Pam. Pam Petunia, Petunia Pam is is sparring with him. You know, I don't know. They don't want to hurt him. Louis, Louis, you know, yeah. but uh, you know, he's he's brought in a lightweight to spar with him. Yeah, okay. You know, they but, should uh, play with each other's minds. Luis Ortiz should show up to Deontay Wilder training camp. Said, "Hey, I'm ready to go a few rounds. You want to spar? Yeah, you want to spar? <laughs> hey, hey, you're gonna you. you're gonna love this. Uh, Nino Benvenuti. Uh, ch- switching love gears Nino here. Uh, Nino Benvenuti, uh, former. As a matter of fact, we our last. Uh, uh, event we did, we showed a Nino Benvenuti fight, yes. but uh, um, Nino Benvenuti, former uh, uh, world champion uh, as a uh, junior middleweight and uh, middleweight, um, and and held on to uh, it was considered undisputed because there was only two sanctioning bodies at that time, and he uh, uh, held both belts at WBC and WBA uh, from uh, 1965 to uh, 1970, and uh, is a Hall of Famer. Uh, not only was he a great fighter, but he was great for the Italians, uh, uh, being uh, an Italian fighter, but um, he was uh, in uh, Rome uh, the other day uh, promoting a, a fight uh, between uh, um, uh, Emiliano Marsili uh, is taking on uh, Mexican fighter Victor uh, Bitanacourt. And there's a, another title on, on the line, Sal. It's for the WBC Peace Lightweight Championship. Huh? Right. I'm saying this. So what? Why? You know what, what do you what do you mean? I mean, how can what? come on, Mr. Suleiman, Mauricio Suleiman? We loved having him on this show, and and he actually yeah really uh, did, said and did all the things that I I had hoped, and um, I I really wonder how Mauricio can sleep at night when there's this plethora of of belts. This the WBC Peace Lightweight Championship, um, and not peace as in a piece of steak. I'm talking about peace, as in love and peace. You know, um, uh, you know, maybe maybe we need more belts. What do you think? You think we need more belts, Sal? You know, what? here's what they should do. There should be one belt for one world title, and the rest they can give trophies. <laughs> yeah. you. you know what? Why don't we just when a fighter gets there in here in the states, we issue a federal ID card when you turn pro. I think the easiest solution. Once a fighter turns pro and gets his federal ID, they should just hand him a championship belt right then. And then, you know, uh, we start putting value in the guys that have more than one. I, I don't know. I don't know. Absolutely. But, uh, Maybe that's it. But you but know, listen. The, the re- ten, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I said you collect 10 or more belts. You know, you're, you might be the super champion. Here's here's the reason why I bring up Nino Benvenuti. The, 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 the additional benefit was just... Uh, the unbelievable thought of the WBC introducing a new championship belt uh, called the Peace uh, Championship. But, um, you know, Nino Benvenuti was brought in to help promote this fight, of course. And he he said, he, he made a statement about Mersilli that, um, well, let me read it to you. He says, Emiliano Mersilli is a fighter who reminds me of the old-time fighters. He has a modern fighting style. But he doesn't do what it takes. He doesn't only do what it takes to win. He's a, he always gives 100% like the fighters of my era did. He will have to do that uh, to win. 
on Friday night. Uh, he says, but he doesn't do only what it takes to win. You know what, Sal? That really struck home with me because that, yeah. in a nutshell, is what fighters of today do. They follow that that Floyd, you know who, uh, uh, blueprint of doing just enough to win the rounds and squeak by a decision. No one cares about going toe to toe. No one cares about engaging. All we care about is uh, is winning the fight. You know uh, what kind of performance, what kind of money's worth, what kind of entertainment value is secondary. It's the same thing with with a, a football team. You know they're up by seven. They got the ball. Uh, you know uh, they're kneeling. They're kneeling down, letting the time tick away. Uh, because, you know, they don't want to put the ball in the other person's hands. It's the same mentality, uh, but for some reason, I can accept it to a degree in, in, in other sports. But boxing, I, 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 to me, that's not the sport. And a lot of young fans think that the sport has evolved into that and accepts it. And the more people that accept that type of fighting, Sal, the more evident it's going to die. Because, you know, with the, today's younger people, they don't even, their attention span is so much shorter. How do you follow fighters that aren't giving you entertainment value? I, I just, I, what's your thoughts of his, about his comment? Well, it is, it is, you know, you don't just do what you got to do just to get by in life. You got to do more to make a statement, to make uh, make it valuable, to 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 never regret and look back upon. And I, I think a fighter uh, going out there and putting his life on the line or or giving it his all, that's the old warrior mentality mindset that, you know, you and I uh, long for in, in the fight game. And, um, you know, to say those days are long gone or not going to be happening, I, I don't see that, Bill. I, I see there are plenty of fighters out there. I mean, we could mention the names, but there are fighters out there today that are of that old generation, that mindset, that mentality. Now, could they sustain that level and that intensity throughout their career? And uh, and, and, and we certainly hope so, because they're the fighters that, that bring the value, that are exciting, that, that uh, we still carry and continue, and we will follow. So, um, yeah, just to get by and do what you got to do to win is not enough. Well, look at Keith Thurman. Keith Thurman was a talented fighter, is a talented yeah, fighter. And, talented. Uh, you know, he wanted to prove it. To All of a sudden, what, what's happened to Keith Thurman? Keith Thurman is a guy that seems to be coming up with more excuses and, and, and goes through the, 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 the whole process of proving that his excuse is true, like the bogus car accident, the, you know, the injury. There's no documentation to back any of this up. And meanwhile, he hasn't been in the ring. I can't even, I, I can't even remember the last fight I he was think. in. I think it was Sean Porter. Um, I, but, I think uh, it was. But, but I, I mean, here's a guy that claims he's the best. And just because, yeah, you know, I don't understand why today's fan – just when a fighter says he's the best, a lot of the fans just believe him. They dismiss the fact that he's got to prove it inside the ring. You know, and, and Keith Thurman is, is I think he's detrimental to the sport at this point. You know, the only fighters that I, ha that I, I can find myself respecting are fighters that actually fight. You know, I, I mean, fighters that win a title, the best way to prove that you're worthy of that title is to defend it. You know, many times you hear people say, you know, it's easy to win a title. It's hard to defend it. And that's yeah. true. So why are these fighters that have obtained titles like Keith Thurman all of a sudden not defending them or defending them against, you know, uh, secondary or third airy, is that a word, uh, level fighters? Okay. You know, I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I just I, I just don't get it. Well, no, and, I, and you know, when you're talking, there's there's two names that come to mind and two different uh, pictures that I have with two different fighters. One that you're mentioning, Keith Thurman. You know, it, it's hard to just follow what I'm going to say. You could put opponents in front of Keith Thurman, and he may or may not agree to fight them or want to fight them. You put any opponent in front of Errol Spence, and he'll jump on and say, "Yeah, I'll fight anybody." <laughs> you know, so that's the difference, and 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 that's uh, and that's what we respect and appreciate inside a warrior's mindset and mentality, like an Errol Spence, hey, that no they're willing to face yeah, but, anybody. But Sal, no disrespect to Errol Spence, 
And no. Errol Spence looks like he's the real deal. But let's be real. He's got two names on his resume. You know, um, and, and, know. and although he's saying he's willing to fight everybody, you know, Deontay Wilder says he wants to fight everybody too and doesn't. You know, it's it's one thing to tell everybody you want to fight everybody and then tell the media, well, we want to fight him, but he, he's chicken. He won't fight me. And you leave out the part where, well, you're demanding $40 billion to step in the ring with him. You know, that's why he's not fighting you. You know, I, I mean, you, you always got to look at the whole picture. Errol oh, yeah, Spence yeah. appears to be the real deal. The only he way did. he can prove it is to get willing dance partners. And that's yeah. the problem with the sport. These guys that are considered the upper echelon, the, the A fighters, if you will, are not willing to dance with other A fighters. They're only willing to dance with B or less fighters. Yes, and that's the problem. Correct. That's the problem. That's you know, what problem. made the previous eras great is the willingness of the other A level fighters to fight each other. That's the only way. You can't assume that a fighter is good just because they perform well against B-level or below fighters no. and that they don't have to fight the other guy. You know, I, I, you know we, we had to live through that for a decade with Floyd Mayweather. You know, so, I, I mean, I, I just, it, uh, it's sickening. It's sickening. But, uh, no, and, and, and case in point, uh, for the younger fans that we have, I'll tell you what, you didn't have to tell uh, Sugar Ray Leonard to get into the ring with Roberto Duran. You didn't have to tell uh, Marvin Hagler to get into the ring with any anybody. Uh, he, he, he would fight anybody. Anybody. These guys would face anybody in the world because they felt they were the best and they wanted to fight the best. And that's how come we could talk about their fights 30 years past, past the dates and uh, because these guys were warriors. And I'm sorry. You show me a fighter with that mindset mentality today and I'm going to be a big fan. And that's, that's you know, like I said, maybe Errol Spence is a little premature, but I like his mindset. I like his ability. I like what he's doing. And, and uh, he's one of the handful of fighters that uh, that I, I find exciting and keeping me into the sport of boxing and, and tuned right in. Um, I got some emails to read, Sal, and uh, we'll get these out of the way. Uh, this one's from my man Willie. He's in the chat room right now. If you're watching or listening, uh, on a stream or on the radio dial or on TV. Don't forget our official chat room that we uh, respond to, even though I do try to respond to the uh, Facebook, simul uh, Facebook uh, simulcast and also uh, up on YouTube. But our official one is up on BillyCBoxing.com. So if you go to BillyCBoxing.com and click in the chat room during the live show, uh, that's when uh, uh, we're in there talking. And, and uh, Willie is in there now. He says, hey, Billy C., great show. Uh, and it's great to have you guys back. I agree with your sentiment that Ortiz is going to lie down for Wilder. It's pretty obvious what's going on here, isn't it? Wilder and his team are hatching a plan that they devised quite some time ago. I wonder how much it cost them to buy off the likes of Stavern and Ortiz and possibly others. Probably the spoils will be divided up between those, all those concerned after the inevitable fight between Joshua and Wilder has taken place. Wilder gets paid. Wilder and his team obviously know that. It's a foregone conclusion that Wilder will lose that fight badly. So this is their last and probably only chance to make him big money. What a devious bunch they all are. But with that said, it's so obvious at the same time. So they're not really being devious, are they? Because it's actually all happening out in the open in front of our eyes. Who do they think they're kidding? He says, uh, by the way, I reran the show the other day. And uh, I nearly always do that so I can catch any bits I might have missed earlier while in the chat room or in making coffee and going to the toilet, <laughs> etc. He says, I noticed something funny. It was a look on your face when Larry was on the phone and he mentioned corruption in boxing. The look on your face was so funny uh, when you reached, uh, when you reacted to what Larry had said. I took the snapshot and attached it to the email. It's the That's eyes, man. Funny. Uh uh, yeah, he sent me a, a copy of that, and I, I the, the look was like, you know, the for Larry. Me uh, when all, I say something. Well, all I'm going to say is for Larry Hazard to mention yes. the word corruption yes. in boxing, yes. It, yes. it just it just takes it to another level. The look I gave was like, yeah, you know, no kidding. There's you know, there's a lot of corruption in boxing. It's one thing that's happened, um, you know, throughout the history of the sport. Um, but but you know, like I said yesterday to Larry. Uh, about this uh, Ortiz and, and uh, you know, Deontay Wilder and the money and everything else. Um, Deontay Wilder's actually hurting himself financially uh, by ducking or not accepting the offer that AJ's team made to him. 
Uh, he has yet to make $2 million. I don't know if he's making... I, I really don't know what the financial arrangements are for the Ortiz fight. Uh, but even assuming he hit the $2 million plateau, he could have tripled that easily, um, quadrupled it more likely, uh, accepting the terms that were offered to him to fight Anthony Joshua. And with a rematch clause, so for two fights, he could have made 10 times what he's making for this fight. And even if Ortiz has agreed to lay down, um, the value of Deontay Wilder will not go up, especially if it looks to the most fans like it was a set-up fight, then the value of Deontay Wilder is going to go down. Meanwhile, over at the other side of the, the ring, when you have Anthony Joshua, what is his promoter doing, a real promoter who promotes fights and who actually uh, does what promoters in the U.S. are not doing anymore, He's bringing Anthony Joshua to the place that Deontay calls his second home in the Barclays Back Center in New York. York, in Brooklyn, and he's going to sell that stadium out. And I think he's going to devalue Deontay more, even if Deontay wins the fight against Ortiz. I think Deontay's team were outmatched mentally. I think that uh, Team AJ is way smarter than the people that are guiding Deontay Wilder. And unfortunately for Deontay Wilder, he's not smart enough to see it. He's loyal and listening to his team, but he's not smart enough to see it. Maybe he should watch Harder They Fall, Sal. Well, you, you are 100% correct here, Bill, and I'll tell you why. Deontay Wilder had his career all sewn up within two fights. Had he accepted the terms, of going over and to fight Anthony Joshua for the heavyweight championship of the world, he with the with the deal he get of seven million plus the rights of the of networks of the uh, closed circuit or, or or whatever. I mean, there's an easy assumption that you could have had him walking away from fight number one with ten million dollars, and if fight number one raised a few eyebrows had a little bit of excitement, had anything to do with the evolving of a fight number two, the guy could have made $20 million in two fights, and win, lose, or draw, he would be set for life. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was very short-sighted of he and his camp. And so to to uh, say that uh, they uh, they had the same intellect as Anthony Joshua's camp, no, I, I, think, I think you hit it on the head again. They, uh, they were outsmarted by that because what is Anthony Joshua doing? Anthony Joshua's coming to the guy's backyard, as you said, where his home is, where he reigns as the name to be, as in his mind. And he's going to come in and just slap Deontay Wilder across the face with a selling out crowd of, of, of and a display and pick up more fans at Deontay Wilder's backyard so that when they do fight, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting, but I, I think it's a genius, and I, I I love it. I love it. Keep and in Anthony mind, Joshua. Yeah, I'm telling you, Deontay Wilder missed the opportunity to have a back to back uh, win win situation, even if he lost. Keep in mind that the British fight fans travel, and the Barclays Center's. You know, it's not huge. We're not talking about an 80, 90,000 no. seat outdoor arena that Anthony Joshua fills on a regular basis. We're talking no. a, about a fraction of that. And and don't be surprised if Anthony Joshua comes to the Barclays Center and you have people cheering for him, uh, you know, that fill that arena. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, to suggest that, that the fans would all be there for, for Deontay, um, and and make no mistake, uh, you know I, I would think that when when um, uh, when Anthony jo when Deontay Wilder fights now even though Deontay Wa even though Anthony Joshua was training for Joseph Parker and his fight is at the end of the month when um, Joseph I mean I'm sorry when Deontay Wilder fights Luis Ortiz in the beginning of March don't be surprised if you see Anthony Joshua in attendance um, you know no, and no. and and you definitely don't be surprised. When Anthony Joshua comes and fights in in the summer at the Barclays Center uh, against uh, Baby Miller, uh, don't be surprised you'll see uh, Deontay Wilder there. And because of the fan draw, 
that you know people coming from England when they put the camera on him, they're gonna boo him. You watch. Yeah, I'm saying all this now, but uh, anyway. No, I I, I think it's gonna come and, to fruition. And it, it, you know what? It, it it makes a lot of sense. And one other thing, speaking about money, you know, the other mistake that that Deontay has made by not fighting um, uh, Anthony Joshua with the offer that that um, Eddie Hearn made is that what the part that Deontay doesn't understand and the part that either his team doesn't realize or just not telling this kid is that if he would even if he accepted 5 million to fight even though the the offer was more but let's say he accepted 5 million which is 3 million more than 3 million more than he ever made in a fight he doesn't realize that every single fight after that as long as he put on a good show, would be in that neighborhood. So, you know, once you get a certain level, once you reach a certain level of, of payday in terms of what you're making per fight, that's your new rate. That's your value. Deontay has no clue about creating value, and he's letting the people around him dictate it, and they're using him. They're, they're, he's, a, he's a puppet on a string, man. Deontay's, you know, it's a shame. Because deep down, the guy is a good man. He really is. You know, oh, I, I mean, I, I like him. I, I mean, think his okay. morals I, are there. I like Deontay Wilder. No, I think his morals are there. It, it, listen, he's a decent his, guy. His loyalty is hurting him because he is being loyal to the to the schlebs around him, and they're not taking care of him. They're not. You know, the best thing they have for Deontay Wilder, like my man Larry Hazard said yesterday, is Mark Breland. And, and I wonder how much Deontay even listens to Breland. You know, when you have all these people in your ears telling you stuff uh, and you start believing it, how much is he listening to Breland? The only indication that he listened to Breland was the first fight against Stavern. But he's yet to fight a fight like that since, which makes me wonder if, you know, he already knows the outcomes. But uh, anyway, let's get to another email. This one's from my man, Joel. Uh, Joel says, uh, hey, Billy C. and Sal, welcome back. Uh, it wasn't the same without you guys. Hope you both uh, enjoyed the vacation. Uh, he says, I was curious if you saw the Vincent uh, Fagenbutz versus Rhino Leinenberg fight uh, over the past weekend in Germany. Rhino was doing well, pressure in the action. Then, due to an alleged head clash in the sixth round, the ref, out of nowhere, waved the fight off, giving the TKO victory for Fagenbutz. Leinenberg asked to have a doctor look at it in hopes that uh, if it was... Uh, too bad a cut to continue that it would go to the scorecards but like typical stuff that happens in europe the ref made the decision to stop it and uh cost rhino the possible victory your thoughts if you and sal saw this fight i did not see the whole fight i saw the actual stoppage i wondered what why it happened um normally at least here in the states uh, uh now now granted the referee generally has the sole power to stop a fight but they normally, nine times out of ten, get the recommendation from a ringside doctor. So if he felt that the cut was uh, uh, too serious, they should have called time and have a doctor uh, uh, inspect the cut and then uh, advise the, the, uh, the uh, referee. Uh, but the part about the head clash, uh, you know, how you can wave off a fight due to an uh, accidental head clash is beyond me. So... Yeah, the uproar about uh, Ryanberg is uh, is is true. It's it's they got some uh, substance there, so. Yeah, I think they do too, and uh, we'll see what happens. One more email. Uh, this one's from uh, my man Johnston. He says, uh, "Welcome back, guys. I hope you had a nice break." Uh, it was the pre- Oh, he's 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 emailing me, David Hay. Uh, Tony Hay. Bello. He says that it was the press conference of David Hay Bello two yesterday. Um, now, please don't get mad because I know your feelings on David Hay. Yes, in case you're new to the show, I think David Hay is a, a fraud. Uh, I mean, a- anybody that puts their foot up on a podium as an excuse. I don't want to make an excuse, but here, look at my toe. But uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> hey, David. He says, I thought you might want to laugh. He says, here's a statement from David Hay on his upcoming fight with uh, Bellow plus Jarrell Miller and uh, his u- ludic- ludicrous comparison of him and himself and Muhammad Ali when he was asked about the Bellu fight, he says a medium day is not good enough. It might be good enough to beat Bellow, but beating uh, guys like Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder, and Joseph Parker, or anyone else who holds a title will be uh, so far out of my reach. What's the point? I'm not in there to get beat by these guys. I want to become the best in the division. Bellow offers a barometer, but it's just not 
uh, but but it's but it's but it is not just the win. If I knock him out in three rounds, but suffer a cut or a knockdown, and it's a real battle, I'll know. Uh, how would Joshua Parker or Wilder handle Bellu? Uh, does he even get past two rounds with these guys? If he gets through more than that with me, then why would I even waste my time t talking about fighting those guys? If I do not take him out in a destructive way and make it look like a competitive mismatch, then I don't see that I can start looking at titles. I agree with that. That's the first intelligent thing I've ever heard come out of David uh, Hayes' mouth. Um, on the subject of Jarrell Baby Miller fighting Anthony Joshua, he says, me fighting anyone for a title is big news. It all solely depends on the fi fight, though. If I go out there and struggle, then it's not worth anything. But if I go and knock, if, but if I go out and look like a million dollars and absolutely punch holes in them, like I believe and said I'm going to do the first time, then people can start making the argument. He's a former champion uh, back uh, on form, the two highest profile bo boxers in the country, and then that starts changing things. Anthony Joshua versus Jarrell Miller uh, versus uh, Anthony Joshua versus David Hay are two different spectacles. One is, who is Jarrell Miller? And the other one is, okay, that'll be an interesting fight. David Hay is alive. Uh, when he compares Hay um, fighting AJ, uh, uh, when when he compares himself fighting AJ, he compares it as Ali fighting Foreman. He says it would be huge. I'd be a huge underdog going into that fight. I'm aware of it. He's nearly 10 years younger, three inches taller, three stone heavier, uh, and I'm coming off a couple of injuries. So for me, that's the Muhammad Ali fighting George Foreman. Uh, coming off of two losses against Kenny Norton and Joe Frazier, and Foreman knocked them both out. Ali was old, finished, allegedly past his prime. Everyone was worrying for his health, and he somehow turns the tables. That's what I believe Muhammad Ali has been most recognized for. It wasn't in his heyday when he was more agile and he was physically superior to everyone. It was the fact that he beat the monster that George Foreman was uh, when uh, Ali was past his fine prime that solidified his great legacy uh aj is the biggest name in boxing what's the point in fighting for a title when no one knows who the holder is if you want the best in the division then you have to fight the best uh with the most belts right now that's joshua but it could be parker joshua is the guy who has beaten the best uh, opponents 20 of them uh, all by knockouts you can't argue with that resume um you know the funny thing about this statement is that all fighters say that, Sal. They all say, oh, to be the best, you got to fight the best. But none of them really do it. And, and, and I'll even take it a step further. Teddy Atlas used to be the most critical guy when he's talking about fights that are happening uh, when he used to do the broadcast on ESPN. Oh, this guy, oh, he's a tomato can. He's this. He shouldn't be fighting. And then as soon as he becomes a trainer, a la when he took over Povetkin and ruined his career, he was putting Povetkin in with tomato cans. So, you know, if you're going to say it, do it. Don't say it. Don't do as I say, not as I do. You know what I'm saying, Sal? Oh, yeah. I, I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> I do. And he's so right. I mean, it's it's funny because you could talk from the outside. You could talk uh, a big game. But when you put yourself in the middle of what you're talking about, uh, and, and, you know, you just classically you said it, you know, do as I say, not as I do. It's uh, it could be hypocrisy, and that's uh, some of the cases we always see going on today. Hey, listen, boys and girls, uh, we had a commercial-free show today, and uh, don't forget uh, tomorrow I got some stuff that we're going to be talking about. Um, one being, uh, I got some quotes for the uh, Daniel Jacobs uh, fight that's coming up uh, in April against uh, uh, Mac uh, Macy uh, Saluki. And also on that card, uh, Jarrell Miller is fighting Johan Duopaz, clearly the toughest opponent of his career. But remember, Duopaz is as slow as uh, uh, molasses dripping down a tree. Uh, I also want to uh, talk, I know we were, going to, we were supposed to talk about it today, but we'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, Adrian Broner uh, and his recent brush with the law. Um, also, the WBC welterweight tournament. They announced all their fighters uh, last week, so I want to talk about that, uh, as well as uh, my man Coach sent me a, um, uh, a, a uh, an article about the FDA introducing a new uh, testing option uh, 
um, for brain scans, which would eliminate the need uh, to do a, 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 a normal CAT scan, which could help uh, combat sports industry big time because uh, the cost of those CAT scans a lot of times prevent a fighter that should be getting a scan from getting it. So we'll talk about all of that tomorrow. And one other thing, um, this weekend on HBO, you remember HBO. They used to have some great fights on it. Well, um, not so much anymore, but they have uh, not one, not two, but three flyweight. Well, actually, two flyweight and one super fly, super fly weight uh, title fights uh, this weekend on Saturday. And uh, Dax Khan will be uh, stopping by to uh, give us his thoughts uh, on these fights uh, uh, tomorrow as well. So you're not going to want to miss, miss tomorrow's show. And uh, we are going to have commercials for tomorrow's show. Today, uh, I don't know what made me do it, but uh, I know I'm going to get in some kind of trouble, like financial. I'm out of coffee. Oh, good thing. The timing is perfect. All I could say is this, boys and girls, make sure you tune in tomorrow morning. Same bat time, same bat channel. Until then, I'll leave you with this. Ciao, baby.